this evening. Um, we're probably in the probably in the most sorry. My name's Niall Berg, and I'm the uh, I'm the manager of the jail, the governor. Um, we were hoping to have this launch in the east wing of the building this evening, but uh, still out of balance to the public. Um, but. We're probably the most luxurious room in the building, actually, which is the former governor's house. Um, just also to say, very importantly, for a bit of health and safety, um, there's a lot of people in here. If the fire alarms are raised, uh, please remain calm. Uh, my colleagues at the front row will, will uh, escort us off the premises using our stairways. But just remain calm. There's a lot of people in here. But uh, my hope promised me to be about 15 people here tonight. <laughs> Um, Michael asked me maybe to mention one or two things about the jail and uh, normally when we have book launches we're normally in the east wing in the prison itself or very rarely in this part. What are, what are we on there tonight? Nothing, it's just it's legally we can't go in there, uh, it's out of balance. So I was thinking about the governor's house, this, this front part of the building which was the old administration. Uh, the governor lived here with his family, uh, maybe the deputy governor, etc, etc. So I was thinking a little, bit, a little bit about that and I found this very interesting um, news clipping from the, uh, from the newspapers from 1874 and there was actually an auction here of the former governor's uh, furniture. Uh, there was a man called Henry Price who was the governor from 1861 to 1873. Uh, he's one of the more interesting governors of the jail, mainly for me because he was here during the, Fe the, Fen the Fenian period and that was obviously a very tense time in the jail and he was also one of the um, governors who actually advocated and actually brought in the use of photography into the prisons in, uh, in the early 1860s before actually any other prison in Ireland. Actually it was only Kilmainham and Derry Jail in Ireland that actually used the camera in the early 1860s to actually photograph prisoners. So he was quite ahead of his time considering photography was very much a new technology uh, at that time in the, in the 1860s. But he died in 1873 and um, it, just the year, about a few months after, there's actually an auction of his furniture here, interestingly, in the governor's house. And it's the auctioneer is a man called George Tickle, brilliant name. And he's based in Mary Street in Dublin. But it actually lists all the, furn the furniture that was auctioned in this house. Now, bear in mind, uh, Henry Price was on £300 a year. That was his, that was his wages. And I just wanted to read it out because it's fascinating. I read it out to one or two of the staff today and they were like, wow. <laughs> just wait to hear this, what was actually sold in this building in 1873. The furniture chiefly comprises of 12 dining room chairs, three easy chairs in Morocco leather, <coughs> A set of tables, pillar and claw, large pedestal sideboard, Grecian sofa in Morocco, uh, gilt chimney glass, several engravings, plain and coloured, cottage piano forte, uh, lion skin rug, two mahogany loo tables, rosewood couch, brass four post bedsteads, feather beds, mahogany chests of drawers, dressing tables, washstands, bedsteads, towel rails, carpets, uh, and oil cloths, window curtains and poles, patent churn, copying machine, folding screen, dinner service of stone, china, cut glass, china and delf, set of dish covers, kitchen furniture, uh, cutlery utensils, um, about 500 choice plates, three garden frames, quantity of flower pots, a heap of manure. That's 300 pound a year is huge money in the 1860s, 1870s. And uh, there's one chapter in Michael's book, and you'll come across about the whole thing about corruption and, and things like that. There was a big inquiry in the 1840s and 50s. And you just think of the money that was coming through this, this building uh, for the governors. And considering the deputy governor was only on, I think it was only on £100, uh, uh, huge money. But anyway, I just thought of, because we're normally in the East Wing, and we normally talk about the actual prisoners itself, but it's very rare we do launches as such in here. But um, uh, the way this is going to go, actually, is um, I'm finished now, actually. But I'm going to bring Liam. Liam Amar is here. Um, you all know Liam. Um, as you know, he's, uh, he's two books published by Repost Publishing House um, of Books of Poetry. And uh, he also has won two, um, um, won two international prizes for his poetry, the Scottish International Poetry Prize and the, Gen the Gerald Manley Hopkins Poetry Prize. And also he's also chairman of the uh, Inchicore Letter Society. 
uh, which is actually celebrating its 20th uh, birthday uh, this year. Okay. So would you please put the hands together for us. <laughs> Thank you and welcome to the launch of the great book. And it's nice to see some familiar faces from the last time we were gathered here in prison. <laughs> I want to assure you all that you're shortly due for release. Bail is set at 25 euro. <laughs> the alternative is free lodgings and not so air conditioning, what you might call unconditional air conditioning. Now, I want to start by saying that I have no doubt that this book will add greatly to the stature of Michael O'Fanagan as the historian. All he has to do is put one on the floor and stand on it. <laughs> What's often said at this area is steeped in history and um, especially the buildings where we are at present. But of course the area is named after a saint, Saint Minor. Saint Minor had a following of 27 monks, a band of monks, and they came here in the 7th century. He was known and um, very well known, he was known from, from the Shannon to the Hill of Hope. And I said to have even preached to them, King of Ireland. He was known as a, a tower of piety. But not everyone liked St. Minor. A rival monk, uh, St. Melru, um, thought of him as lazy because he wasn't too fond of manual labour. Now, Minor had his confession, which was a, a, a big deal back then. And like a lot of uh, saints, he made a prophecy. And it's well worth reminding ourselves of his prophecy. He said, a time will come when there will be daughters who are flippant and tart, <laughs> devoid of obedience to their mothers. Oh, my God. When they of low estate will make much mutterings, and seniors will lack reverent charity. There will be impious laymen and prelates both, perverted wicked judges, there will be disrespect to elders, soiled barren of fruits, the weather will be deranged <laughs> with intemperate seasons, women will be given up to witchcraft, the churches unfrequented, deceitful hearts and perfidy on the increase. A time when God's commandments will be violated and doomsday as token will occur every year. Well, I'm glad none of that ever came to pass. <laughs> <laughs> now, I wrote uh, a few notes here at home, um, not realizing that we actually will have the two paintings with us tonight. Um, the one we have over here is actually Kilmainham in the 7th century, uh, painted by Michael from memory. Disappeared <laughs> 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 uh, on Wikipedia and was taken up by a few uh, forum sites and uh, where to see the number of comments. So I'd like to just give you one of those comments. And he's referring to the right hand side over here where the two monks are beside the fire. Uh, so this guy logged in on the site and he said, I was surprised to see those two hoodies and all come in at the bonfire. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting to mug some tourists. <laughs> some things never change. <laughs> and um, behind me here, uh, also painted by Michael, um, is the man himself, uh, St. Wine. And because of the resemblance uh, to Ronnie Drew, um, I fondly, and I stress the word fondly, uh, think of this as Ronnie the Druid. 
everywhere in the vicinity of Kilmainham there's a story to tell. The Royal Hospital, uh, built on the lands of St. Minan, uh, his original monastic site, and later the Old Knights Templars Priory. The original title of the Royal Hospital is the Hospital of King Charles II for the ancient and named officers and soldiers of the army in Ireland. Um, it's often referred to as the old fogies home, but now we know that not only were they old, but some of them were quite ancient. Today we have open air festivals held in that vicinity. Well, this Buddy's Acre, actually three acres of ground, was originally unwalled. It was a popular place with many festivities held there in association with St. John's Holy Well. Also a place of much revelry where courting couples frequented. Or again, Paris. <laughs> <laughs> Executed criminals were buried or simply dumped there with just a few shovels of air toward them. Curiously, it was also where some of the very famous were buried. Morrow, grandson of Brian Baru, is buried beneath the famous shaft. Robert Demet, for a time at least. Dan Donnelly, the boxing champion. Donnelly's funeral was one of the biggest funerals ever seen in Dublin. 80,000 people in attendance. Other places of interest, Long Meadows, which is striking past, now the War Memorial Gardens, and of course the Phoenix Park. As you might expect, there are lots of sources available on the histories of these places. In fact, there's so much to be gone through that it's often difficult for people to source. In the great book of Kilmainham, <coughs> Michael O'Flanagan has carefully gathered the most interesting and most important of these <coughs> facts together in one volume. In so doing so, he had to seriously <coughs> edit his research in order to fit it all in one volume. Now that cannot have been easy for Michael. He was once accused of being overly inclusive in his work. At a time we were both working for the Liberties Heritage Group, and Michael was putting together a dictionary of local biography. The famous and the nearly famous associated with each accord and Khomeini, everyone from Brian Baru to Billy Toft. But our supervisor remarked that Michael had included everyone who had ever passed through the area traveling at less than 60 miles an hour. <laughs> You didn't get Amy Casey, so. <laughs> no, that might have been meant as a put down, but it also illustrated Michael's diligence as a researcher. Quite a lot of the book is concerned with corruption by the authorities. Corruption at the highest level. Terrible goings on. And that, of course, was a very long time ago. Oh. <laughs> I'm glad we live in a much more civilized society where nothing like that has happened. This is a book of facts, as in any book on history. We're not allowed to change or invent new facts. I often see books, The History of Ireland by so-and-so. It's as though the person is trying to claim ownership of the history of Ireland for himself. People have different approaches, different presentations. They might even draw their own conclusions and say, what if, if only, but they must stick to the facts. I know that Michael, in this regard, has chosen the words collated and curated. He's not claiming authorship. He's assimilated facts from a wide source of material, and in so doing so, has created a useful book of reference, which I here recommend to you. Typically of Michael, this is not the little book of Kilmain. <laughs> it's not the big book of Kilmain. <laughs> it's the great book. <laughs> and here to tell you more about it is the great man of Kilmain, Michael O'Fan. Thanks very much. 
Er du spurgt om hvad der smager af hårdt af dem nye bergen? Og hvis lige mamma og mig jævn er en grad af kors i døren, er en okay sjov. Så der er kort af fyr, og hvis jeg kom til at give en maske gang. At the end, I would like to thank Liam for being a great friend and colleague to me over the last quarter of a century. I'd also like to thank Niall for hosting us on this occasion. Since Niall took over here, the jail has seen a quadrupling of the number of visitors coming into this historic site. He's kept the ship on an even keel through some stormy waters, and he's now overseen the biggest restoration and reconstruction of the jail since it was first saved for the public by volunteers back in the 1960s. <coughs> now, I'm not going to give a lecture or talk on the history and heritage of the area. I would just like to draw your attention to the large number of others who have engaged in conserving and recording the history of this area over many years, <coughs> including Joseph O'Brien, who is here at the, at the front, for his Inchicore to Mainham District, Colum Kenny's Kilmainham, a settlement older than Dublin, Etna Massey's Roger Outlaw, Liam O'Mara's History of Richmond Barracks, and also the books by Liz Gillis and six books by Paul O'Brien, including the history of the South Dublin Union, and the many books by Michal Dublin and his wonderful website, Kilmainham Tales. If you've never seen Kilmainham Tales, just go into Google, type, go into Google, type Kilmainham Tales, and you will see a fabulous outline of everything you ever wanted to know about the area. It's all there. What I really like to talk about is this question. Why do we like history? Why are we fascinated by it? And why are some people obsessed by it? I think the answer is that whatever stresses and problems of daily life we are, we are all conscious that we are living through history, that the present is history, and that the future will be history. Over the last 10 years, and more particularly since the death of the Celtic Tiger, people have become even more interested in history. People doing family trees, looking up their local <coughs> history, the history of their local area. During the Celtic Tiger, the government and local councils were only interested in property. You couldn't get funding for anything relating to history or heritage. One well-known expert on architecture and George in Dublin told me on the, on the north side, that the north side of Emmett Road was dirt and not worth saving. Sorry, Norman, you may. <laughs> okay, I'll <I'm> check. <laughs> Only dirt, not worth saving. <laughs> Uh, when the orchard was demolished, it was replaced by a featureless block of apartments. Cash was king. However, when the crash came, suddenly history and heritage were back in fashion. Because tourism was the only revenue stream that could be developed by either the local councils or the government. The decade of commemorations has also acted as a spur to the huge interest in local history, personal history, and national history. Modern technology, videos, documentaries and the internet, the YouTube and Facebook have all allowed people to publish and share photos and information and to weld their personal history and the history of their lives and their families into the wider picture of the nation's history. It's against this background that I decided to look at the way history was written by those who did the original search, some who were writing in the most beautiful styles, 200 years ago and when you if you get time to read the book you will see the quality of the english absolutely beautiful the adverb was still alive in those days <laughs> this is where the idea for the great book came from and now i'd like to finish with a poem by shelley ozymandias I met a traveller from an antique land who said, two vast trunks of, uh, two trunkless legs of stone stand, stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command. Tell that it sculpt or well those passions red, and yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them, 
and the heart of fed. On the pedestal these words appear. My, no my name is Oz Man Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my, on my work to ye mighty and despair. Nothing beside remains round the decay of that colossal wreck. And bound boundless and bare, the long and level strands stretch far away. Okay, now to finish off, I'll say something very unusual at a book launch. Everybody wants a book signed. Uh, these books will make excellent presents. <laughs> However, if I sign them with your name on them, you won't be able to give them away. <laughs> okay? So buy two copies. <laughs> well, I'm not suggesting that. But, uh, but uh, yeah. So, um, uh, as another, another fact, uh, my signature is of absolutely no value. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you.